thank you to all of you who have gathered here today physically in the Wind Center and for all of those who are online right now who are uh, delighted to still be participating here in our 2023 Green Hole Lecture. My name is Andrew Comerville and I am the still new president here at LPTS. Delighted to meet so many of you who are back this week for our board meetings but also our friends, our family, those who value this place near and far. Thank you for taking the time to introduce yourselves, not just to me, but to one another. We are a better community because we are together and we bring a diversity of thoughts, ideas, experiences. It is a joyful time to be here at Louisville Seminary. I'm gonna get us started with a prayer and then introduce Tyler Mayfield, who will come forward and introduce our wonderful speaker tonight. As you feel comfortable and led from your tradition, from your background, I'd invite you to pause, take a moment, and as we center ourselves and give thanksgiving for this opportunity, let us truly look forward to a good evening together. Gracious God, we come before you with hope in our hearts. In spite of the pain, hurt, war, and continued suffering around us, we know there is an opportunity for us to learn with and through one another. Help us to pause tonight. Let us reflect, let us be challenged. Let us wonder and let us truly anticipate peace where it might be possible. In this space, we are thankful for the opportunity to be guided and led by Professor Gray. And we have hope in our hearts for what we might discover in one another throughout this evening. We ask your continued blessing on Louisville Seminary, on this world, and all of your people. We pray this with peace and with hope in our hearts. Amen. Amen. It is my pleasure at this time to introduce our A.D. Rhodes professor in Old Testament, Tyler Mayfield, to introduce our speaker. Tyler Good afternoon. We are delighted to welcome to the Global Seminary this afternoon, Dr. Halil Gray. Dr. Gray is a scholar of religion and ethics with interest in Jewish legal discourse and the study of oppositional religious groups. He is a professor at Miami University of Ohio, just up the interstate here, where he teaches in their comparative religion department and in their program in Middle East Jewish and Islamic studies. Dr. Gray holds a BA from Yale University and a Master of Theological Studies from Harvard Divinity School, and he has his PhD in religion from the University of Chicago. His research includes a decade-long ethnographic study of controversial religious groups. You might know a few of them, like Westboro Baptist Church or Neture Karta an ultra-Orthodox Jewish um, anti-Zionist um, group. If you're interested in these topics or in um, his talk today, you can easily find him, I am told, on TikTok. So uh, look him up there. Uh, just a bit about the structure of our afternoon together. After his lecture, we will have time for question and answer. I have the mic, so raise your hand and I will um, come to you so that everyone can hear uh, the question. So uh, if you have a question, uh, hold it till then. If you're online and want to enter your question into the uh, chat feature, that would be great. Uh, we'll also um, have questions from those who are attending the lecture online. So this afternoon, we welcome Dr. Gray as he joins us to present his lecture called Questioning Toxic Theology and Tolerance. Will you join me in welcoming Dr. Gray? Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. I feel very welcome. I'm walking around the campus and people say, oh, you're Dr. Dre. <laughs> yeah, it's so, uh, pretty, pretty amazing experience here. And uh, uh, yeah, so I was invited to talk about toxic theology. And I have to say it is very relevant to the work that I do. Thank you. <laughs> It's very relevant to my research interests and to my project, which we call Empathy and the Religious Enemy. And so today what I'm going to try to do is talk through, um, uh, is this not working? Okay. 
um, kind of talk through three things. My qualms about the concept of toxic theology, the approach that I take, and the two case studies that I'll work through slightly, and some of the benefits and risks of the approach. Um, I'm hoping that you'll be able to get some things out of this, um, but let me know how it goes. <laughs> now, this term toxic theology is not well defined. It's rarely used in my field, uh, which is religious studies. But I know roughly what is meant by it, and I did some searching online. Um, so I can tell you that it's not a very popular term, but it has become popular uh, in the last, say, five years or so. This is a Google uh, Ngram viewer. You may be familiar with that. And there are some uses of it that are more in a therapeutic context in the sense of uh, the notion that you have a toxic theology and then you have some kind of uh, system of abuse and religious trauma. So I'm not gonna be talking about that aspect of it. I'm gonna set that aside. But more generally, toxic theology has become popular about, among ex-evangelicals, if I can say that, and liberal Christians to mark relig religious beliefs um, for instance, too much of a focus on sin or unduly promoting chastity and purity or causing people to feel very guilty or anxious about going to hell. Toxic theology may also refer to beliefs that are deemed to promote hatred or foster violence or lead adherents to dehumanize others. Now, your invitation, uh, which I appreciate, uh, really pointed uh, to the example of transgender persons whose identity is opposed by many conservative Christians and whose medical care has become a political target. Your example is meaningful for me because I've researched Orthodox Jewish rhetoric and policies about trans people and gender affirming surgeries. And within the gender divided world of Orthodox Judaism, there has been some very harsh opposition, though some rabbis do seek to accommodate and support transgender people. I've also studied Westboro Baptist Church, as you know, that has uh, been anti-trans for a long time. To work on that. <laughs> um, and most of the anti-trans movement, I would say, is mobilized by conservative Christians, and they justify it by, by what many people would consider a toxic theology. Now, certainly, scholars in religious studies have ethical commitments such as concerns with violence and dehumanization, but we generally don't use the word toxic. So as a religious studies scholar, what I try to do is I study cultures and beliefs from the position of an impartial outsider, from a non-judgmental, neutral point of view. I'm trained to bracket off and distance myself from the norms and beliefs of any culture. So I avoid expressing moral judgments of religious subcultures. I don't want to say that they're good or bad, right or wrong, true or false. And so I sense that this non-judgmental approach um, in addition to helping me fit in within religious studies, when I go talk to people, I think it helps me connect with them on a human level because I'm not giving them this condemnation. I think they're more able to open up. Um, in particular, um, as Tyler mentioned, I study religious groups that are radically oppositional to mainstream cultures, and they are labeled as hate groups. I teach about them in my classes. I bring student research assistants with me uh, to interview them, um, to interview them, and we ask them some very personal questions. Now, before I say more about this research, oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Before I say more about this research, I do want to say that I'm actually trying to understand these people. Okay. I'm trying to understand them as a community. I'm trying to understand them as a group uh, and as individuals. And I want to understand their beliefs, but I focus on how they grew up, how they raised their children what their lives are like at home or at school or at work. And I interview them to understand their emotions, to help them bring that forward, to talk about their experiences, to talk about how they treat each other and their internal ethics. I am a trained in ethics, by the way. <laughs> um, and I want to hear how they experience stigmatization, ostracism, and they get bullied. I want to see if I and my research assistants are able to connect emotionally with them across the binary us versus them view of the world that so many of them have. Now, I recognize that this is not the way ordinary ordinary people act towards these groups. And I don't know if you're ordinary or extraordinary yourselves, but um, this may not be your natural reaction to these kind of folks. And so many people 
feel deeply hurt and distressed by their offensive language and are really disturbed by their religious beliefs. And I, I get that. Um, and many people want me to share their disgust or hatred or you know condemnation of these groups, and they want to feel solidarity from me. And I have to say, people are somewhat bothered when I try to make human connections with these groups and then talk about it, and I'm just trying to understand them. So you know, even some of my closest friends are very unsettled by this, that I'm not willing to take a stand and condemn these groups. Um, so you might be bothered, you might be bothered too. Um, and if you find yourself troubled or angry during this talk, um, and by my academic non-judgmental approach, um, I hope that you'll, uh, you know, sort of reflect on that. You can look around the room, you realize you're not alone in this, right? <laughs> and, you know, share your reactions with me. You know, I, I really want to hear uh, what people say about this. Um, I do want to say that I have some specific qualms with this concept of toxic theology, or maybe similar terms. Um, so I want to share those. Um, First one, I think, is this issue of polarization. It's natural to, um, um, the first one I want to mention is polarization, right? Um, because the reaction that you might feel that um, we should be condemning these groups and we should be um, labeling them as toxic is really in some ways amplified in the current political atmosphere. Um, in the US today, our political discourse really reflects a lot of partisanship. And we tend to sort social groups into informational silos and political silos, I suppose religious silos too. And there's a kind of affective polarization, which is very emotionally driven. It's not that we're simply partisan, it's that we have this emotional energy, this intensity, this anger, hatred, and so on, divisiveness associated with our positions. And so people with opposing political and religious views often act as if they don't want to understand each other, right? They want to invalidate each other. They want to essentialize the opposition, to assign them like a collective label, right? Like, oh, you're evil, you're insane, you're fanatical, as if that's the essence of their being. And then that allows you to dismiss them and whatever they say. So those kind of labels can make us feel better. And I'm not saying that people wouldn't feel better by calling somebody toxic. I mean, I get that. Um, but it doesn't actually lend to understanding and understanding the other. <clears throat> Some of my liberal friends and relatives, who I know pretty well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <Zoom>. Thank you. <laughs> they do not want to engage, dialogue, talk to a Trump supporter. They are comfortable, some of them, labeling 70 million people who voted for Trump, Trump, nearly half the American population, as if they're stupid insane, deplorable, shall we say. And so my question is, you know, is that really a rational or constructive approach? You know, there are times in history when somebody has a dangerous ideology and maybe you feel they need to be stopped. And okay, I get that. But what I think has happened is that otherwise thoughtful liberal people sort of slide into this us versus them mindset in a very binary way. And it ends up being bolstered by all sorts of like, dehumanizing uh, rhetoric or imagery, which decreases our ability to understand our opponents, whether they are political or religious. And this definitely goes both ways. So I'm talking about the liberals, but certainly it goes in the other direction. So in the face of effective polarization, it'd be wise to question much of the vocabulary that we use in today's term, in, in terms of today's theme, is there a point at which toxic theology would come across not as a constructive critique, but as projecting and reifying a mythic enemy. I want to talk about the second form that I have about the use of toxic theology, especially for me and my colleagues in religious studies. Isn't the toxicity of any religious group or any subculture in the eye of the beholder? Uh, this is somebody from Liberty University, 
uh, writing about toxic culture, toxic theology. It's actually not a bad piece. Um, this is the World Evangelical Alliance talking about uh, toxic religion, right? So from their perspective, what do you think they consider uh, toxic? Um, what do you think is toxic? Oh, actually, the right thing there. What do you think is toxic in this logo? Logo here. What do you think is considered? Which religions are toxic in this logo? And you know, what's the approach that atheists take? What do they consider to be a toxic religion? So many cultural, sorry, many cultural studies scholars are not, and they don't want to be in a position to adjudicate the toxicity of religious groups. I teach at a public university. We have many Catholic and evangelical students. And would I be fostering a good learning environment if I'm sitting in the in the classroom or giving a speech somewhere in public and I'm saying, oh, you know, there are all these priests that have been accused of abuse. There's the anti-trans reading of the Bible among, among evangelicals. And I start to label that as toxic. So this brings me to a third doubt I have about the concept of toxic theology. And, uh, you know, I have to say the, the term toxic really resonates with me because before I got into the study of religion, I was the policy director of the National Environmental Law Center. And my issues were like toxic chemical accidents, toxic pollution, toxic use reduction. And we use toxic all the time because the public got it and it helped our campaigns. But the chemical industry lobbyists would sometimes, you know, sort of pull me aside or tease me or talk to me and say, look it, you know, you're always using toxic, but everything is toxic. <laughs> it just depends on the dosage and the exposure. Some of you know what I'm referring to. Um, and I have to say, this is actually not a bad point. So at the risk of learning from my toxic industry opponents there, <laughs> I'm tempted to argue that the impulse to divide the world into toxic and non-toxic theologies, you know, a bit problematic. I mean, what would a non-toxic religion look like? You know, does it exist? Uh, do progressive Christians and Jews believe that their clergy and their members are never cruel or deceptive or hurtful or dehumanizing? Do they think that their theology is so robust that any toxic deviation is just due to individuals and not to their theology or not to their groups? Mm -hmm. I can say the same thing to conservatives, but you're my audience. <laughs> So to what extent can liberal Christians digest the critique of conservative Christians coming at them or from atheists coming at them to reflect on their own theological discourse and their own shortcomings? Now, of course, you're not going to necessarily see it from a conservative standpoint, but can you start to put yourself in that mode? So look, at, I don't mind if conservative evangelicals criticize the theology of liberal Christians, and call them toxic. I don't mind if the liberals do that to the conservatives. You are all, I shouldn't say you, but liberal Christians, conservative Christians, you're all in the business of, you know, making moral and theological judgments. That's fine, but it just doesn't have to be my approach, right? I don't want to have to label any religious subculture as toxic. So let me explain how I proceed. If I can move forward here, okay. I'm going to share with you my research on two religious groups. They've already been mentioned. Uh, and many outsiders would consider these groups having a toxic theology. In my teaching, in my courses, I expose students to all sorts of religious phenomena. And for instance, this semester, they were reading about religious racists, which is pretty intense. And we did a lot of work on satanic groups and Satanism, which was fabulous and fascinating. And I don't just teach about the religious radicals. I've also gone there and I've interviewed with them and I converse with them. And I adopt a kind of both a public and a private sort of discipline when I talk about them in this descriptive non-judgmental way. So the gist of our approach is sort of like this. First, we try to find subjects who are from a radical oppositional religious group. They vilify some people or maybe many people, and they themselves get vilified. I try to develop a rapport with them and relationships that go across the binary divide, and I try to interact with them in a non-judgmental, friendly, warm manner, right? So I'm not, when I'm with them and also in private or outside, I'm not trying to judge their morality or theology. 
I'm, and I'm generally not taking any sides on the issues that they care about, which happens to be a big change in my personal life. Um, I also seek to uh, sort of resonate with them, understand them on an emotional level. So when I say empathy, I mean empathy in the sense of understanding people's emotions, not just their perspectives, right? And I want to encourage them to talk about their lives and to show themselves as people to be vulnerable. And for various reasons, I've been able to record them on video. Okay. And so I have these video recordings of them talking in their lives. And so part of what I'm trying to do is educate people, right? Now I'm educating my students who join me in some of these visits with the oppositional religious groups, uh, but I'm also out there in the public. I want to be able to debunk misinformation about them. I want to share the kind of video clips that we're going to show you today. And again, in my public life, mostly in my private life, I'm avoiding uh, the kind of things that you might expect people naturally to do. So I'm going to say a little bit about uh, these uh, groups. I'm going to start with Nichiri Karta. It's an ultra-Orthodox Jewish group. Most American Jews view them as extremist and hateful and insane. And most American Jews would label their theology as toxic if they knew that kind of wording. Um, so this is really a great group. Sorry. This is really a great group uh, to study with and talk about with a Jewish audience. Um, but it's a much more complex case to work through with a predominantly Christian audience. So I'm just going to mention it briefly. Uh, um, I, I will talk about Westboro Baptist Church. And yes, you may know about them. How many people do know about Westboro Baptist Church here? Okay, so maybe I don't need to say as much. Um, but they're anti-gay. They're, they're predominantly well-known for being anti-gay. Uh, and now they are also uh, pretty strongly anti-trans in a lot of their discourse. But they're also anti-Catholic, they're anti-evangelical, they're anti-liberal Christian, uh, and so on. And when I tell people that I listen non-judgmentally to Westboro Baptists, do you know what people usually say to me? This is a typical kind of thing. That's all very nice, and they watch my videos, but how are you going to change them? You know, how long is it going to take you to change them? And I have to say, when I first started doing this back about a dozen years ago, I did sort of have this imagination that maybe my active listening to them and connecting with them uh, would somehow change them and change their perspective. Okay. <laughs> uh, then I came down to earth and, and they helped me, by the way, to, to come down to earth on this. <laughs> um, as did my relationship with, by the way, uh, the IRB, uh, which oversaw, oversees work on human subjects, right? So uh, you have to tell your human subjects what your goals are in research, and you don't necessarily go to a religious group and say, oh, by the way, I want to convert you or something. Right? <laughs> so, yeah, so there are all sorts of reasons. Um, but, you know, that goal was really um, misplaced, and besides being unrealistic. And rather than change them, what I'm trying to do now is really change us, right? So, I'm not sure that I can change all of us. Um, maybe I can change some of my students and some of the people I've worked with. And I think if I can't really change them, I'm trying to change myself. And this work has had a profound effect on me. And um, I think a lot of ways I should just be talking about this from I statements and not trying to overgeneralize beyond, beyond myself. Um, but I do wanna say that the work I'm doing is not something that I say everybody should be doing, right? I want you to understand what I do. Um, I want you to um, notice or feel the humanity of the people I study. Uh, I'd like you to be able to look at things from my perspective, but I'm not trying to persuade you to join me, okay? This may not be your cup of tea, and I'm not saying that this work is generalizable. It's not like some standard operating procedure. It's not like some categorical moral imperative. And there are plenty of professionals and individuals who I think should avoid this, and we'll be talking about that. So um, I'd like to just pause for a second. This is what I maybe do more in a classroom. I hope nobody's offended by that. Um, how are you feeling at this moment? And if you think of yourself approaching a group like Westboro Baptist Church, if you're familiar with them, what would make it hard for you to sit quietly in a friendly manner and talk to them? I don't know if you want to write anything down or just pause for a second and think about that. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, I'm going to try to quickly talk about uh, the Turing curve. Okay, now this is a group that really fits a lot of the criteria. They're very small, they're radically oppositional, they vilify very strongly one group of people, and they are in turn stigmatized and vilified. Uh, they are known as the Turing Carta, they are the guardians of the city. And, uh, um, you know, ordinarily I might not talk about them, like I said. But because of this Israel Hamas war, I feel like sort of a duty, and as a person who happens to be Jewish, that this seems like an important uh, group to mention. Now, they are ultra Orthodox or Haredi Jewish, and it's a small group, right? So you can sort of look at the Jewish population, the population of ultra Orthodox anti Zionists, which itself is relatively small in the world. Um, and the Churi Karta, I don't know how many people are involved, but it's a pretty small network. And I'm going to try to give you a sense of why they are controversial. Now, when they campaign against Zionists and against the state of Israel, oh, Zionism is Jewish nationalism. That's not clear. They accuse the Zionists of being complicit in the Holocaust. And can you sort of get that if you're blaming Jews for the Holocaust, even partially, it is really outrageous to many American Jews, right? I think it might be outrageous to other people too, but a lot of Jews do not have a lot of patience for this, okay? Another thing, oh, uh, and, and where they really sort of uh, jumped the shark maybe, uh, was in 2006, a group of them went to Iran to a conference that was widely described in the media as a Holocaust denial conference. And Iran is a strong enemy of the state of Israel. The president of Iran at the time um, put this conference together. Do you, you know who David Duke is? He was one of the attendees. So you can imagine how this would alienate all sorts of people, but it also alienated, if I can go back, this population of people who hold a very similar theology to them, who are the other ultra-Orthodox anti-Zionists, but had not sort of gone to the step uh, that this group had, had gone to. And uh, they've made some other shifts too. Most importantly, they made a shift to being pro-Palestinian, right? So they don't believe that uh, Israel should be under Jewish sovereignty. They believe Israel should be under Arab or Palestinian sovereignty. Um, and they started to wear the kafia and uh, use the Palestinian flag. So the Turi Carta is even more controversial than, you know, the 100,000 or so ultra-Orthodox Jews who are already anti-Zionist. And the other thing they try to do is placate the enemies of the, of the Jews and of Israel. So they've met with Hezbollah. I don't know if you're familiar with Hezbollah. They've met, do you know who this is? Uh, Louis Farrakhan. Um, Louis Farrakhan, head of the Nation of Islam. Again, I, I don't need to judge him personally, but in the American Jewish world, he is considered really a clear example of anti-Semitism. Um, so it's shocking to people that um, these rabbis would go meet with them. So, uh, okay, I don't think I need to say too much about the Israel Hamas war. It started uh, a few weeks ago, it started on a Saturday on the Sabbath. <laughs> and on the following Monday, thousands of Jews got together in New York City to rally in support of Israel. Okay. Um, so, I think I, oh, do I have a video here? Okay. So I, I want to show you about 15 seconds of this video. Do we think if I can? So this is uh, the Naturi Karta group um, at this rally with the thousands of Jews out there two days after a tremendous massacre of, you know, like 1,200 Jews in Israel, in, or Jews and other people in Israel. And they're basically saying that it's the Zionist fault, right? And, the state of, and they're talking about the state of Israel and its atrocities. So can you imagine how upsetting this would be? So uh, they, they do this every year. They do this, you know, pretty often. But this particular rally just a couple of weeks ago, you needed 
a police court. You had a lot of police there to try to protect them because people were super angry at them. So um, a lot of people think that they are cruel and crazy and inhuman and traitors, but they're also stigmatized, right? They're hated, right? People dehumanize this group. Um, so when I do presentations to Jewish groups, boy, you know, they are really surprised that I am willing to talk about them in a really non-judgmental, empathic, calm way. And I show what it's like to meet with them. You know, when I was hosted by them for the Sabbath, I went to their prayer services. I was given honors, uh, all sorts of, you know, interesting stories of jumping on a trampoline with one guy and his family. Um, and, you know, I, I show these clips to American Jews. Um, and in a sense, I think what I'm doing is I'm trying to rehumanize what Natura Carta looks like in, in their actual lives. Let's go to the next slide. Thank you. So now let's 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 go to West Bar Baptist Church. Um, as you know, this is a standalone church in Topeka, Kansas. They have maybe 60 or 70 members. Uh, most of the people in the church are related to Pastor Fred Phelps, who founded the church in the 1950s. Starting around 1991, they became pretty well known because of their intense anti-gay, God hates signs and street preaching, right? So many liberals were outraged at this church during the 1990s, and they started to become very well known. And then about 20 years ago, they spread the anti-gay picketing to the funerals of soldiers who were killed in Afghanistan or Iraq. And this drew the wrath of so many conservatives and gave them a lot of press coverage. Um, so they now alienated both liberals and conservatives. And you know, they picketed against Catholics, evangelicals, and liberal, uh, liberal Christians. I know with pastors in Topeka who were, you know, sort of personally uh, picketed against. And when I first spoke uh, to them about a dozen years ago, um, they started uh, preaching at Jewish institutions and against Jews as like Christ killers. So before I show, uh, before I show you another video about them, I, I want you to think about this. What would you do in response to West Bar Baptist Church? Because Americans seem to have two approaches. One is you ridicule them, you try to pass laws to stop them, people counter protest, and that's very typical, um, but it helped make Westboro what it is, what it became, which is one of the best known churches in the, in the country, and really one of the most persecuted, if you think of legislation against a church as a form of persecution. And as Todd Powell Williams uh, uh, showed, he's a scholar, that all this energy against the church really um, reinforced them internally, right? In addition to giving them uh, incredible, incredible coverage, and it led to an escalation of their efforts. Mm -hmm. There was also a Supreme Court case that got a lot of attention as well, and they won that handily in 2011. Mm -hmm. So the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, suggests that people just ignore that group. Okay, just ignore the church. And I want to ask you, it, which would you do, or do you, you know, and how effective do you think it is to take that advice? So I want to give you a sense of what it's like to uh, see the street preaching of the Westboro Baptist Church. I'm going to show you a two-minute clip. It's not from the anti-gay content, but it's, or the anti-gay ministry, you could say, but it's rather from the anti-Jewish content, and it takes place outside a, a Jewish, confer uh, Jewish conference, and I think many in the room will recognize the uh, parody of the song they're doing. And that's what you get from the old Jews in New York. Yeah, get 
knock yourself! You knock yourself! Now you find that in the Torah, don't you, brute beast? Not. Just obey God. Then you won't have to be dropping those F bombs all over the place. Okay, so when I show this to a class, you know, I, I try to draw a couple lessons. One is, you know, it's hard to find Christian anti Semitism like this that is so open, but also, you know, relatively peaceful, relatively non violent, right? Um, so that has a certain kind of opportunity there. The other thing is that they're out there, you know, every day trying to admonish and rebuke sinners, right? This is about their sense of a biblical duty to rebuke. And the third thing, as you saw from the woman passing by, that Americans, you know, we're sort of easily provoked. You know, our impulse control is somewhat limited. And the ADL can tell people to ignore groups like the Cherry Carta or uh, West Road Baptist Church, but you know, people really are not going to do that. So I decided to try out a third approach, which is what I've described of interviewing and trying to understand them. And actually, my main contact with the church was Shirley is Shirley Phelps Roper, right? And she's really the person I have the closest connection with in the church. And I want to show you now a clip from Fox News that she went on in 2006. Oh, I guess I can. Hey, Thank you. Thank you. So she was on Fox News after, do you remember the Amish schoolgirls who were shot um, and they were about to have a funeral? Anyway, so she gets on Fox News. You're going to watch this clip. And let me suggest a couple things, if I may. Okay. Notice how you feel emotionally during this clip. I don't know who you are. I don't know your religi religiosity, your Christian background and how this might have influenced you. Um, notice your emotions. Notice her theology. And if you want, you don't have to, but if you want, imagine what she might be going through emotionally uh, dealing with Sean Hannity. <laughs> and if, if you don't want to watch, this is, I'm not going to show you many intense things from, from Westboro, but if you don't want to see this, this takes about four minutes, you could walk away or two now. Members of the Westboro Baptist Church in Topeka, Kansas, have been protesting at military funerals since June of last year, carrying signs with anti-gay slogans. Yesterday, they announced they were planning to protest at the funerals of the Amish schoolgirl shot to death in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, earlier this week. What is that message? The message is, is that God has put his standard in the earth. He expects his creatures to obey it. If you obey, he'll bless you. If you don't, he'll curse you. America has sent away her day of grace. America is doomed. All right, you're giving me what sounds like a bunch of talking points. I, why would you cause more pain to this community, the Amish community, and these families who have suffered? Do you have any sense of how much additional pain you would be causing these families by protesting at the funeral of these young girls? There isn't any way to fix that situation for them. It's not going to be any less painful. If we are there, we aren't there. They did that to themselves. And you say they're not involved. What do you mean they did that to themselves? I mean, they sit over there and create their own form of righteousness instead did of... Did those girls deserve to be killed? Uh, well, they did get killed, and they did that. Who controls the hearts of men? It was at the hand of an angry God. Those girls are dead. The, they, they, they deserve to die? They did deserve to die. How can you possibly make a statement like that. Because that's exactly what happened, and it happened how at could the you hand possibly of say the Lord that, your How could you possibly say that young girls who've done nothing wrong, who are innocent, who are just a few years old, who've never sinned, who've never done anything, deserve to die? How could you possibly make a statement like you that? You told me that you serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who says that when Adam sinned, all sinned. There are no innocent human uh, beings. You know, and you, their pro parents you, you protest funerals of soldiers. Yeah. You protest funerals of anybody who, it seems, dies under any circumstance. Anybody who's not a member of your church is a sinner and is hated by God. Uh, don't go to you, the, anyone you, who's you, not. A, if you don't serve God, yeah, then... But who serves God beside people in your church? Well, uh, you tell me. I, I don't see anyone on the landscape. There's nobody, in nobody except people in I your church, which is them. basically your family. A few hundred members of your family are the only people on earth who serve God. Everybody else deserves to die. You need to get out on these streets and warn your neighbor that his sin has taken him to hell, fulfilling the royal law right. to love your neighbor hey, as yourself. 
You're really a sick woman. Oh, you no. are. You are a sick, like cold, soulless, thank you. twisted human being. You're, where's your soul that you come on the air and these young innocent girls are going to die and you're going to and you're going to open up the family's womb and pour, pour salt on it? Where's your heart? Where's your soul? Where's your compassion? Our where's message, your love? Our message is for the living, and that is the only loving thing to do. What about the living families that lost their daughter? They, they lost did their daughter. that to themselves. The, the, no, because some animal killed them in cold blood. The, the families didn't do it. Who controls the heart? Did you sin? Who controls Did you ever commit the adultery? Heart? Did you no, have a sin? Did you have not. a lust in your heart? Did you ever get angry? And that, Did you ever sin? Are you? You've got have you ever sinned, Miss Perfect? Here? Well, of course you know that I've sinned. You have. So you're a sinner. Point. So why so did you die? Would you deserve to die? Well, of course. All of us deserve yeah. to die, so you but I'm not the one who did die, and my life. message is for those living people who brought that pain this upon themselves. This is what themselves. I see about you, Shirley. They need to obey the commandments yeah. of the Lord their Your God. Your entire life is, is now sort of focused on bringing pain to other people. The families of innocent girls who died, the families of innocent soldiers who died, God hates and his children more innocent this. than you. They didn't sin those like you admit children, you sin. Those children were what killed at the hands of a raging mad God to I'm punish those families, to punish the state of Pennsylvania, your filthy manner of life and your rebellion against what God your and your conduct perfect? against the servants I of God know, wait a to point B, the dead You're, children. I want to know what your sins are. Oh, I'm not going to talk to you about any of such thing. I don't glory in my uh, shame like you seem to no, want to. No, I just find this amazing that everyone else is a big sinner but you, and How you admit to you being a sinner. How about you obey the commandments of the Lord Which your God? Which ones did you break? Obey the commandments of the Lord your God. You What's don't fix this by saying two wrongs make a right. That's what you seem to be saying. No, that you I'm may not is, say what God requires of you, you, you know what I'm saying. if you don't. And although I'm, I'm speaking to our audience beyond you because you're brain dead. I'm, what I'm saying to you is you are a soulless, thoughtless, mean, thoughtless, cruel human thoughtless. being. Thoughtless. Yeah, you need to take a breath out. Okay, I'm going to skip the theology piece of it because I think a lot of you are very skilled at this and you notice pieces of theology that are coming up. What you may uh, not be aware of, they think it is God that is doing the hating, right? They think, as she's saying, that Christians are warning their neighbor that that's an act of love, okay? Uh, I, I certainly want to draw your attention to the dehumanizing language that the Fox folks are using, like calling her brain dead. Uh, and are you also noticing how they're talking about her sin, okay? So here's what the background is. Shirley had a child out of wedlock. Okay, and this is the sin that you would call fornication. He's referring to it as adultery, right? And she's been mocked and criticized about this for decades. Um, and she's never spoken about it publicly, as far as I know. And she's had lots and lots of media appearances, uh, some much easier than this one. But when I visited her, she sat down with me and she told me her story. And she was willing to be very hospitable to me. It was in her, in her living room. And she wasn't indulging the shame. She was just sort of saying, you know, um, here's what happened. And, you know, I haven't thought about this in years. I don't know that I've ever told, told my husband this story, right? Um, and it was certainly embedded in, this, in the church's views on sex and marriage, which I'm sure that many liberal Christians would consider as toxic. But for her, it was a story of forgiveness and kindness on the part of her father, Fred Phelps Sr., her father, by the way, was a very intense guy. He, uh, he was accused by some of his children of being abusive, and he did come across as what people might describe as a bullying manner. And, and he was intimidating even to his own children, including to Shirley. So she told me one day, she told me about how she stood up to him one day, and it was like a defining moment in her life. And it was about a sexual sin from somebody else in the church. It didn't happen to be hers. And so I want you to watch this sort of edited version. Oh, I'm sorry, I probably should have put forward here. Please. Members of the Westboro Baptist Church in Topeka, Kansas have been sorry. protesting at military funerals since June. Yeah, if you could put forward. Uh, hold on a second. So um, this is an edited version. It took her a while to get this whole story out about how she confronted her father, but I'd like to be able to watch that. So uh, I, I call this, we need to have a conversation. And uh, let me just say, I think the captions will help make it clear, but I'll ask you afterwards if there's anything not clear. There are two threads.
There's Fred Sr., her father, and Fred Jr., who's uh, one of the older brothers in the church. I know I was. I, I yeah. was intimidated by. So what was the defining saying, moment thing? As much as you feel like sure. Okay. It was an issue that needed to be dealt with by the church. Are you allowed to see what it is? It was a little more sticky than some issues because it wasn't your rank and file event that all of a sudden you look up and you've got an event. So we are, we realized we've got to talk about this, that it was my perspective and not reality. It was my perspective. What was? The, my, the being intimidated. That it isn't, see, it's like, I'll say the wrong thing. And I thought, this is what I thought. And I'll, and it'll just be stupid. And you know, because my dad's so smart. You understand? That I really don't have anything to offer here. So I should just be quiet. And it felt intimidating. Well, you know, he may not be the kind of person who's so, who's so interested in hearing your thinking. But he is. Maybe he's not able to act that way. But he is now. He does now. Because of this thing that happened. Because he yes. need, at that point, he needed to hear your thinking. And he needed to hear Fred's thing. Somebody had done something wrong. And it wasn't a little wrong. It was a big wrong. This person is imperiled over here. It's a, it's as There's only one kind of peril that's important. It's your soul. Right. That's the peril. And now, what can we do to help? What can we do to help them? Being very straight-laced, being raised in a self-righteous, works-righteous environment, that was a segue for my dad. And I have no doubt that he needed this lesson. And all of us needed something out of this. You understand? That's the way God rolls. I'm trying to understand. It's, it's, it, when you look it's up, a little abstract for me. But, well, let me put it to but, you this way. But I think somebody was, it was in peril in their soul. along the genre of what you want to talk to me about. You understand? Okay, that I understand. Okay. To find a moment where he saw things differently. Where, where he saw that he needs to be uh, reaching Why did he as opposed to... Preaching. <laughs> well, yeah. Why did he think he needed to be reaching instead of preaching? Because, because it was tried, necessary. He had tried preaching and it hadn't worked. Well, because you you don't get anything back when you're just saying. So what happened in the defining moment? How did you see? How did you see the define the moment occurred? Well, it was in the middle of the night when I woke up, and I thought, and I wasn't going back to sleep because I saw it. I saw what was happening. I saw the frustration of him needing to have the conversation. And, and we are not able to have the conversation. So I went down in the middle of the night and woke up my dad. And I said, Take, take, take your time. Take your time. I said, we need something different. And um, there's a well of wisdom. I realize that this is a perspective thing. It's our perspective. And But you can't get past a perspective. you got to get a little help. It's got to come from both sides. Right. Understand? So, um, he did better. Wait, wait, say what you said to him. I said, we need something different. There's a wealth of wisdom to be had with these guys. You're right about that. They do have words to say. But if they don't think that they can say them, well, they'll say them to me. They'll say, we say them to each other. So that we need something else. We need something different. Do you remember sitting with him? No, I stood. I was, I was nervous. Really? Yes. I said, I need to tell you this. I said, I, I, need, I need you to hear me. But when we go to have these conversations, we need something different. We need, it needs to be an environment where we can have a conversation, where we don't feel like that, um, you know, because we come from uh, growing up in, 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 with that feeling that, uh, you know, we just, we just kept quiet. We were just... 
that it's that you don't have anything really uh, whereby you can have a conversation. You understand? To fix it. See, it was our perspective. Not to him. He didn't see it. He didn't see it. He thought that this was just. He figure, He figures. I'm willing to speak my mind. If they had, they would speak their mind. Exactly. He's assuming other people are sort of like him. Exactly. But not everybody is like everybody else, personality-wise. Exactly. And he's that. That's been a. But see, he's got such a. His whole life has been kind of a tidy, you know, keep it all where he didn't have to do that. He has sort of control, kind of. Well, yeah, but thing. and it just ha fell out that way. A lot of it fell out that way. Yeah. But somewhere along the way, my dad, um, uh, you know. I couldn't get past that role where if my dad talks to me about a thing, he's going to fuss at me. I know I was. So, um, let me just pause here a moment. Was that clear? Are there any questions people have about what was going on in the interview? If people want to reflect on this first time, perhaps. Okay. Um, I want to show you one more interview. Um, this is with JL. She's from the next generation, Shirley's or my generation, I guess. Um, she's the granddaughter of Fred Phelps. Uh, she's the daughter of Jonathan and, and Paulette, who have been very hospitable to me and have been interviewing with me since 2010. Uh, JL is a nurse. And at the point in the interview, she's mentioning the role of empathy in her nursing as a nurse. Um, there are two women, other young women from the church sitting next to her, and she recently had a baby. So she's going to mention hormones, and that's the context for that. Um, it's, it's about six minutes, I think. You're not going to be a very good nurse if you're not empathizing. So, yeah, definitely. What do you mean when you say empathize? Um, looking at from their point of view and f and putting yourself in their shoes and imagining the discomfort that they're having or whatever you know whatever they're experiencing. Mm -hmm. And the things that help, uh, and it's kind of the same thing because yeah. I went through the nursing, but also right. when you have people coming in the law office, the first step is for me asking them, "Tell me about your case. Tell me about what's happening." So it's kind of the same thing, yeah. and so you. They're at a weak point in their life, most likely. Is that right? Going through hard yeah. times, and they whether need it's help. a domestic case or a criminal case, yeah. you just have to be able to be patient and listen to their problems. But the things that help me is that these core foundations, these core doctrines, which is to love your neighbor, right. and it's there's a lot of things that go along with that. It's not just rebuking them when they sin, although that is essential yeah but it's being kind being gentle being patient not being easily angered not you know keeping record of wrong it's and so when we read these things and you know we're supposed to keep reading the bible keep and then we have our elders and the sermons every week that teach us how to more how to appropriately apply it, apply mm -hmm. it. yeah and so that we just had a sermon from charles who it's talking about really how do you not, how do you bless your enemies, like Christ said, but not become partaker of their sin. And so that, you know, these sermons like that, they really help me. And um, of course, just reading the words of Christ and how he lived. And his example and trying, you know, to emulate that as much as we can. And, and it's, it's a very personal thing. It's not just, I'm out on the street in public it's every personal interaction, loving your neighbor. Wait, love I'm the sorry. people who love you. What thing can't be? So, it's so the people who hate you that that are hard, hardest to, you know, be kind to. And yeah. that's the most important time to do it. Yeah. And well, it's the same one. <laughs> I'm crying. You're supposed to give me a break. <laughs> um, at any time to love your neighbor, it's when it's the hardest. And when they're the most hated and cruel to you and like one you know out on the street you know somebody comes up we were in 
I, that, when you said Philadelphia, it reminded me of when we were picketing there. And somebody came up and threw a hot coffee at me. And oh, yeah. he's like, yes. you know? No. I, it didn't upset me. It actually made me happy. But <laughs> I was like, okay, this is awesome. But, you know, being able to go through those things and and have a comfort that that you are properly applying it. And from the heart that you're sincere in your love for your neighbor. And hormones. <laughs> <laughs> they're real. And they're a real problem for I'm just saying I pity any woman who has to have hormones. <laughs> I think a lot of them do. I know, darn it. <laughs> Poor women, I empathize. <laughs> oh, but yeah. So I just I mean it it is something that you you may feel very strongly about. Well, what what I, I want to come back, but what, what's hard about it? I mean, oh, I'm not saying that it's hard. You, you, I'm just saying when it when it seems as a, you know, in your mind, you think, oh, that would be hard. It's be a, nice to somebody who just fell cop, threw coffee on coffee. On. Well, that happened to Becca too. Well, that yeah. was so I had coffee on it recently. It, you, when you would think of it, it just doesn't outside that it would be hard, but it shouldn't be hard, and it it really isn't hard. It isn't hard. Well, it's very easy to suffer wrong and bear it patiently. That's, how you, that's what you should do. Then where, where are the tears? What's the tears? I'm an emotional person. <laughs> like, I'm hormones. Did I mention hormones? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but put words, put words to it, if you don't mind. Oh, just that I, I feel very strongly. This is the most important, essential thing to do. And uh, I sure hope I'm doing it right. I sure hope so. And I, I feel terribly guilty when I don't do it right. Not loving my neighbor properly and having any kind of vengeful or, you know, I really, really don't like you, you know, kind of thoughts. So you get those because thoughts sometimes. Well, of course you do. And all kinds of awful things cross your mind and awful sins that you commit in your life. Nobody is sinless. Nobody is guiltless. Um, and you feel it to your core that you deserve death and hell. And if you don't start there, I feel sorry for you. If you don't start there with that perspective that I deserve every wrong that anybody could ever do to me, Christ bore that. Christ bore the worst torture and ignominy and his death, his shameful death. He did all of that, and that's my example, and I deserve all of that, and worse, and death, and hell, and thank God I have a hope, thank God I have a hope, that I will escape the eternal death. That's where my focus, and all my emotion, and all my care is wrapped up in. You're not going to be a very good nurse. So, um, yeah, I'm curious to know uh, how you feel, how you respond to these, um, how you react. For me, you know, even watching this, it just brings me back to how I felt interviewing her. I felt so sort of connected and close to her when she was saying all this. Uh, same thing with this thing with Shirley. You know, for all I know, this leaves people cold. And so I don't know really what... I want to give you a chance to just sort of process it for a second. So I would just turn to your neighbor and just share your reactions either to the clip of JL or the clip of Shirley and just talk about it for a minute, how you're responding, what your sense of it is. And you can do that on Zoom too. Hey, Shirley, you're Thank 
say and it seems like maybe what's most fruitful is to try to move quickly to what you want to say any questions or things you want to share with me let me just first start are there any i, I do have more i'm happy to say but do anybody anybody have a clarifying question about what was going on uh during that clip okay so i i think i'll just maybe briefly go through some of the points that i was going to talk about i was going to talk about the benefits of what I think this is for me and for my students uh, and for research. You know, part of it is that you get a kind of rapport or a way of relating with people, uh, a kind of skill that I think is useful to my students. We're also building a fair amount of understanding and knowledge about these particular groups, which I don't think other people are having access to. Uh, so for instance, there's stuff I learned about Nuturi Carta that all sorts of historians who have studied them don't know about, and I've sort of talked about that. Uh, and people are, in, my students, and I think to some extent, I'm, I'm also you know, able to learn you know, interview skills, uh, listening skills, interactional skills, conversation. We're trying to build these kinds of conversations. Um, and I'm hoping that it's a kind of thing that is going to reduce affective polarization, uh, for the people who are exposed to it, at least. Um, now, I do want to point out this having empathy is not the same thing as having sympathy for someone, mm -hmm. right? And I certainly don't want to come across as defending or doing apologetics for Nurturi Carter or Westboro Baptist Church. So, non judgmental in both directions. And this is not a dialogue. I don't come to them as a Jewish theologian or a <laughs> religious Jew or something like that. Um, I think the skills that we're 
we're building for people are useful for people who want to do dialogue. And I think the same thing can be said about conflict mediation or about therapeutic counseling. People want to go into these areas that we're giving them skills that I think is useful for them. But again, this is not some universal duty. This is not some grand political strategy. It may not be your cup of tea. I, I totally get that. Um, I do think there are some problems that people raise that you might want to think about. And um, I, I'll just sort of briefly go through what some of these are. One is it can be argued that you could have a kind of epistemic harm to somebody if they feel forced or required to go listen to somebody who is very oppositional to their identity. Yes. Okay. So I don't think that I'm doing that. Um, and I would not want to do that. Um, now, I do have, for instance, actually, the person who's gone with me the most is a queer man who loves this kind of work, would love to have a good rapport with Shirley, but he's obviously volunteering to do that, right? But people should not feel uh, forced into this kind of uh, non judgmental positioning to a group like that. Um, there's also a question of like, are we just advocating some kind of tolerance? And I have to say, tolerance is a, a pretty fraught concept, and it's actually a very political concept. Um, I'm not going to go into the whole history of tolerance right now. Uh, people like Wendy Brown and other scholars have really thought about this, but part of what they're arguing is that tolerance is, oh, sorry, uh, tolerance is like a discourse that, that puts people into different kinds of sectors. You have those who are tolerant, you have those who are sort of the dominant mainstream group. You have those who are tolerated, various kinds of marginalized groups. And then you have those people who are not tolerated, who are like the barbarians, right? And so tolerance is a discourse of civilization versus the barbaric. And uh, like Wendy Brown connects it to imperialism and colonialism, and it's a pretty problematic concept. There's also a pretty good argument to consider that you shouldn't overdo it with empathy depending on your moral reasoning skills. So you don't want to get so swamped with emotions connecting to somebody right. that it shifts your priorities in terms of what's important to work on or in that particular case regarding that person. So there's a whole argument. Uh, and I, I think this book is actually very fascinating. His work is very fascinating. And uh, you know it's a little subverting uh, to talk about uh, going against empathy. The other thing that um, I'm often asked about is how can you call this a neutral point of view at NPOV? There is no such thing of neutr as neutrality. And you know, this, this uh, sorry, this particular, uh, I saw this on social media, this image of the notion that there's no neutral was put out there by somebody on the uh, pro-Israel side in the current conflict. But you can imagine somebody on the pro-Palestinian side using the exact same thing. Um, and that, that's why if people want to come from that position, but this is very different than my uh, fundamental understanding of the situation. I try not to see the world in a binary terms, us versus them, and that I think is sort of the basis uh, for what they're saying. When I think of it about a neutral point of view, I'm not saying philosophically there's some pure neutrality. I'm saying it's like a discipline or a protocol that you go towards um, and you're constantly iterating and making adjustments. Mm -hmm. I happen to do a lot of work on Wikipedia, and Wikipedia has one of its central pillars is this notion of, do I have it here? Uh, neutral point of view, okay? And so we'll create like an article, mm -hmm. I recently created an article on transgender genocide. I created an article on transgender asylum seekers. And in that discourse of the editors behind the scenes, it's not about, or at least you're not supposed to be um, arguing or debating the morality of it. You're supposed to be figuring out how do you write this in an encyclopedic informational way. So that's what we mean uh, by NPOV. And that's sort of um, the kind of approach I take in trying to talk to folks. Um, so, okay, so I'm working towards this kind of uh, relationship with people, and I'm hoping it sort of is a kind of a practice in a sense, even though I I do really, I'm very interested and want to understand the Westboro folks and the Turi Carter folks, but I think it's part of a skill building and a thought experiment 
for a broader effort at dealing with uh, political divides. Um, and I wanted to give you a little bit also a sense of part of my inspiration or thinking about this. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Emmanuel Levinas, maybe you have to take classes on him here, uh, reading Total, Totality Infinity is quite an experience. Um, but he talks about the grotto of ethics in your encounter with a face-to-face -face encounter with a person when you're seeing their face and you're being with the person. And so for me, um, COVID, by the way, was very difficult because I didn't want to try to talk to the cherry card people over Zoom. There's something about being in somebody's house that and being with them that really is a different experience. And some people talk about that empathy can have like this embodied kind of sensation. And so I feel like the face-to-face -face encounter is very important. This does sort of remind me, by the way, um, that even though I'm interested in empathy, I don't know that I actually have a good sense of empathy. Like some people are very skilled empathically. I would not say that I'm on that. And so maybe that's the kind of thing that I've chosen to do this in order to <laughs> improve a little bit. Um, and and, and, and this, this also sort of struck me um, that the relationship with the other, which is like a conversation, creates an epiphany for you, right? Um, that's maybe more your language than mine. But it's it, it has been an epiphany for me to have these kinds of conversations, to have this kind of uh, sort of relationship building and vulnerability coming from people like Shirley. Um, and it really has opened me up and, uh, to a whole different way of approaching uh, these groups and I think a lot of other things in my life. When she says this thing about we need something different, like we need to have a conversation, like I'm inspired by that, I, I, partly because I've listened to this clip a, a bazillion times, but I'm inspired by that notion. And so maybe it is a kind of epiphany for me to believe that that's uh, where we need to go. I'm sorry, that's not where we need to go. That's where I feel I need to go. So again, yeah. Um, and and I, I, I do wanna say coming back to toxic theology, if I can say that, um, I don't want to sound like I'm faulting other people for using the term, uh, but I want us to notice how we react to these groups with abhorrence, with condemnation, condemnation, with all these strong protests. And I want us to think about whether we're actually reinforcing the construction of groups like Westboro Baptist Church and Arturi Carta as a kind of mythic enemy and when you think of the divisiveness of the American landscape right now, maybe that's valuable for some people, but to me, I would think that we want to have something different to cross those kind of divides. And if my work can be a bit of a proving ground or a test case for that, um, that would be very meaningful to me. So thank you so much for inviting me uh, to this talk and I'm happy to have questions or conversation. I'd be happy for you to talk to your neighbors again, too. So, um, thank you. Thank you. Sure, so we have a couple of questions um, from the chat. Yeah, so someone asked about Shirley and whether she was um, abused. Okay, I think that's a, a good question. There are people, like I said, who have left the church who have accused uh, particular individuals of having done something like abuse. Um, Shirley would certainly never use that terminology, to my knowledge. Um, now, the family does believe in corporal punishment. And uh, uh, right before, um, when was this? Okay, a couple of weeks ago, I spoke to Shirley and uh, one of the elders in the church about what they thought of toxic theology. And uh, they, you know, they have the groups that they consider toxic, for sure. Um, and I asked them about corporal punishment. And it is an important aspect of their theology and how they uh, believe they should be raising children. And they're not, you know, unwilling, you know, certainly Charles was talking about, yes, you know, somebody in theory could be overdoing that, 
and that would be inappropriate. They totally get that. They do not believe in abusing children. Um, so I don't know if that's partly an answer for yes. Yeah. So, so Shirley is talking about being intimidated. She's not embarrassed about the family's use of corporal punishment. You know, you know, don't spare the rod. Um, but she does not characterize it as abuse. Great. Thank you. Others. So um, before coming here, I would have said that uh, you know one of the things that concern me about these groups is what I would call provocative behavior. That is what it seems to me as an outside observer watching the news or whatever, that they seem to do things that are deliberately provocative in a way that isn't necessary. Is that, first of all, is that fair observation? Maybe you don't want to say, but uh, wait, wait it, it's completely fair. They are not ashamed of being provocative. But do they, do they, okay, so they are, yeah, they are trying to get attention. They're trying to provoke people. Um, I think both groups are trying okay. to do that. I, I'm sorry, am I interrupting you too much? No, no. Why don't you go to your second part? No, no, no that was it. You're answering <laughs> it. I guess, are you sure? Yeah. Okay, so, I mean, again, uh, it's sort of odd for me as a Jewish person to come up here and talk about Christians, but <laughs> my impression is a lot of Christians want to spread the word, and they want to spread the gospel, and they use all sorts of methods to do that. And the Westboro Baptist Church, for instance, they are very interested in spreading the words of God. And at one point, actually, they, they've, they've made various transitions, by the way, over the, especially since their pastor died, the senior pastor died. But one of the things that they, they've done is they put Bible verses now on all their signs because they're very interested in getting the word out. And they have a lot of qualms about me and where I'm coming from and am I coming from a satanic kind of place. Uh, but they do hope that whatever I say, whatever I publish will include spreading uh, the words in the Bible. So they use provo provocation for that. And can I say one more thing about it? Which is, it's it's sort of similar to asking, like, is do they just want a lot of attention? Is, is part of, I don't know if that's what you meant, but people sometimes say they just want a lot of attention. And okay, but you know, people do want attention. And I want to be able to give people the attention that I'm able to give them. And I would love to see more people do that, you know, not just, not just with Westworld. We see all sorts of people out there who act like they need attention. So it's a question of like, can we give them the attention that is warm and listening and trying to understand them? I suspect it takes a, a lot of energy for you just to get into the situation where you can have these discussions. And I feel like these discussions could be helpful for all of us to learn from. But if I were to be able to beam you into a Hamas stronghold tonight or something, can you imagine that I mean, they might be peaceful and having fun and talking to you, right? You know, but wow. What might you learn? I thought, but it's your process. I think your process can be really valuable for all of us, but it's probably hard. For us to find opportunities to do that or create the opportunity. I don't know. What do you think? Um, well, I'm guessing that this is a somewhat liberal audience, at least here. And it wouldn't be that hard to find people who are, say, Trump supporters or who are conservative Christians, because many of you have those in your extended families, if not your immediate families. So I don't know that it's, it's always hard to find people across a pretty strong binary divide. Um, you know, it does take energy, um, and there are various aspects of my life that happened to fall into place that gave me some of the skills and backing to be able to do this. Um, but I do notice that my students can get, and I get pretty drained, but my students can get very drained and exhausted. Uh, and I, I bring them there to Topeka for just a few days. And this just happened in August. And they were like, wow, this is weird. Yeah, I don't know if they were totally burned out, but they were just exhausted after a day of these kinds of interactions because you just have to, I guess, emotionally adjust so much and restrain yourself and calibrate what's going on. Uh, some of them don't entirely understand the background. So coming in as, as an experienced person is very different, you know, in terms of my energy level uh, with my students. Like I, I can go for 10 hours with these folks now and, you know, one interview after another, and for my students, it's super draining. Um, 
Naturi Carta and Westboro happen to be groups that I want to try to describe as nonviolent, at least physically nonviolent, and they think of themselves as peaceful. You may not realize it, but Westboro Baptist Church has done a lot of civil rights work. Okay, so Fred Phelps was a litigator for civil rights in the 1960s. Okay, and I believe they were inspired by the civil rights movement, people like Martin Luther King, and they believe in nonviolent protest. Okay, so um, it happens to, I was pretty nervous when I first started uh, meeting with them because I didn't know what it would be like. I didn't know if they would be coming at me the way they came at Sean, the way she came at Sean Hannity or something. Um, but no, I mean, in person, these folks can be very hospitable. Um, and I chose them because of, you know, that. Um, if I could do Hamas, I would do Hamas. You know, if I could sit down with them and it was a safe thing, or if I could bring my students to a safe thing, I would certainly do that. Um, and I think, I mean, I think many people would benefit um, by being listened to in a way that's not coming at them in a judgmental way. So not that people can't benefit from being critiqued as well, for sure. But but yes, I think it would be amazing to be able to visit with Hamas. And there are plenty of Jews who, not plenty, there are Jews who, who have gone to Gaza and have been meeting with Hamas. I know I know these people through uh, social media. And the, the, the uh, Neturi Carter people uh, visited with Hamas as well several times. A couple of questions for me. So the aim of this skill that you're describing is for the benefit of those who choose to want to understand. Is that correct? That that it is and not for any effort for a transition in behavior in the person that you're actually talking with. And I ask that question because as you describe these two groups as nonviolent, I would submit that they are extremely verbally violent and harmful for those who they claim to love. Their definition of love is what's problematic for me. But and I and I track with the, the, the effort to understand, to uh, have some understanding of where people and what makes them tick or what what where they're coming from. But what I'm having an issue with is the the other side of it, that, that if it transforms me and helping me to understand them in a human way how does that bring about peace if leaving them continues them to be verbally violent and harmful others? yeah so i agree that the term nonviolence is a fraud term and so i do try to say physically nonviolent, or I, I try to put it in some kind of context because i understand what you're saying um and certainly the same thing would be true of how people look at the jury card. I mean, people, in, in some ways, it's maybe more intense for many people because people think that the jury card is supporting, they, they view it as supporting terrorism. Uh, so they, they view it as like giving a hand to people who are really actively violent. Um, but certainly there's a lot of violence against uh, gays and lesbians, against transgender people. So yes, I, I get what you're saying. Um, yeah, my goal is not to change them. Um, my goal is not to change their behavior, not to change their speech. Um, I've actually gone through a process of trying to come up with principles around speech that I thought that they could agree with, that I thought many other people could agree with. So I did start to work on that kind of a process because they also believe that there are limits to speech. Um, and they also believe there are limits to harming people through speech, but they obviously have a different view of that. Um, I, I, I do want to clarify, I am trying to help people understand them, and I'm not always, it's not just for me to understand, I do want to educate other people about it. So I don't ask everybody, do you want to be educated about West Or I'm assuming you came here because, you know, you're open to that, but certainly if somebody wants to walk out and they realize it's not for them, that's fine. But yes, I want other people to understand, not just people who are like, 
does that make sense in ter terms of what you were saying in choice? Am I answering your question about the other yes. part? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Hi, I just had a um, quick, more of a clarifying um, question for you. Um, so I guess what would be the line to be drawn between, you know, something, because you were mentioning about verbal violence, right? What's the line that's drawn between um, just saying something that doesn't, you know, agree with the other side, but, you know, it's just a disagreement or a criticism and actually being verbally violent to the point where it is being abusive, you know? Because I know a lot of us, it's really easy to say sticks and stones and break my bones, but words can never harm me. But we know that that's not true because they do. But what's the difference? Where's the line to be drawn in that? You're not asking about the line in terms of what I say to them? Just in general, I guess, you know, whether we're talking about like, um, you know, them protesting about hitting gays or just maybe like a, you know, saying, oh, I just don't agree with this concept. Yeah, I'm not sure that I have a theory of um, when language crosses that line. So to me, that feels like a, sort of a moral judgment. Um, but it is true that people are calibrating, right? And the Westboro people are calibrating. They're not, they're not out of control entirely. Um, and you know, the picketing, when they're in a picket and in that little uh what uh Paul Williams called like a ritual space at that picket, or the uh Nature Carter people, when they're cordoned off in that space, they do they do have sort of a collective effort, but in that sense, they get very agitated. Um, but they are controlled in what they're saying. And so when they meet with uh, me and with my students, they are not using the same deeply offensive terms that they might use, that they do use on the, on their signs and in the pickets, okay? And, and in fact, if you, this comes up a lot, but if you notice that the, this particular clip with Fox News, it was Hannity who said God hates than the F word, who was not Shirley Phelps Rover, right? And with when I bring my students there, you know, again, I went there first, I wasn't sure what it would be like. They are not using these terms just willy-nilly. And I asked them about Judaism, I asked them about Jews, and they're they're very clear on what they want to say. So they're not mincing words or they're not holding back, but they are not trying to offend me while I'm sitting there in their liquor. Now it is true in the last trip, um, there was a, a young a young woman, I think she was roughly like a senior in high school, um, who we interviewed, and she did say some terms that uh, most people take offensive that would be considered slurs. And um, my students found that pretty hard to listen to. And it was just a couple words, but it stood out in all our debriefings about the trip. Um, so it was very unusual for them to do that. Um, and, uh, and 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 this is not just the Fox News thing. Like um, the, these folks work in all sorts of public, you know, companies. They're out there, and you know, they're, they're, so I remember one woman, um, Archie, talking about being uh, she the government uh, agency manager, and all sorts of people will like, I don't know, you call it ridicule her or harass her. By using these terms as if that she as if she's just using them willy-nilly. So that is a that is a, a dynamic that's problematic. Sure, thank you. Okay, last question. So you've been clear about when you speak with with and meet with these folks, you want to hear non-judgmentally what's where they're coming from. Um, and that you're not trying to change them, but in the understanding of moving toward peace or moving toward relationship, is there any place that as they've been heard, they want to hear back? Mm -hmm. Or is it you you were there to listen and you, you're not gonna be pushing, you know, listen to me now, but can peace come if we don't have us listening to each other? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, 
really great. Uh, when I first started going there, it felt very like I had to protect myself. I had to not reveal anything about my own identity or religiosity or family. I was pretty concerned about that. And partly for myself, partly if I want to model it for other people, I want them to feel it's comfortable to go visit with them. Um, but then uh, I was at a Jewish conference. Uh, I don't know when this was, 2018 maybe, and I gave a workshop on this kind of stuff. And somebody asked me the same kind of question. It's like, uh, isn't empathy a mutual process? And I think it was from that point that I started to sort of give them an opportunity to ask me questions and get to know me better. Um, and there have been some amazing conversations that came out of that. So there is a little bit of a process like that, but um, the, the structure, it is true, the sort of the structure and framework of what we're doing is much more like my trying to understand them. It's not really exactly a dialogue. Um, and things have happened in our relationship. You know, first of all, there are many different people in the church. I have different relationships with different people. But so, for instance, you know, um, Shirley Phelps Roper started to invite me for dinner. Um, my spouse came with me once to Topeka. She invited us uh, to dinner. Um, they have they have my students over now for like pizza dinner. And, you know, they're all bonding over talking about anime. And I have no idea what anime <laughs> happens to be. Um, so there is there is a there is a kind of rapport building that goes on, um, but doctrinally the way they look at it is it's the world of sheep and the world of goats, yeah. right? And so it's very clear no matter how I come across and how we're connecting in a friendly way, there is still that difference. And and you know I have to say my sense is some of these people are very warm friendly, empathic, not everybody in church, but they're very warm, friendly, you know, people, right? Um, I think more than I am in a lot of ways, you know, I, I could be sort of a stiff professor kind of guy. Um, and so I would think a lot of their relationships in the world um, would sort of work the way, you know, any relationship would work, except that often people come up against this particular aspect, this important aspect of their lives. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. Please, Jerry and Benjamin, Dr. Gray, one more time. Well, if you have any time afterwards, uh, please join us on the Lynn Center. Just a couple of quick announcements, though, before we take off into the world. A reminder, our Caldwell lecture, you can need to register by November 7th. You can stay up there. I hope the folks on Zoom are getting that around the broadcast as well. Uh, Dr. Spurrier will be here with us no, on Tuesday. Give me the date, November 9th. You need to register by November 7th. Otherwise, we're in the midst of a wonderful semester. Board of trustees, members who are here, interact with some students, some staff, some faculty, and let us all be very thankful for part of the community that can have Dr. Gray here to be able to speak and certainly to be challenged by those words and think about what we do next. <laughs> everyone take care, and we'll see you soon. Have a good night, and goodbye to everyone on the Owl on Zoom. <laughs>